Good evening and welcome to Look North, our top story tonight. Four years since the first COVID lockdown, we speak to those still living with the devastating consequences of the virus. Over for a year now, I'm still suffering. But like people say, you know, you look well, but they don't know what's going on in the inside. We'll look at the wider impact of the COVID pandemic. Also tonight, breaking night flight rules for the second year running, but Lees Bradford Airport won't face prosecution. March of the day, the sports stars walking 175 miles to raise money for motor neurone disease. Blooming marvellous, the newly renovated Camellia House restored to its former glory. And it's been a bright day with some sunshine, but as you can see here from this picture taken at Eco Reservoir, it's also been a blustery day. Uh, the key word for the weekend, cool, especially tomorrow. I'll be back later with all the details. Hello and thank you for joining us this Friday evening. This time four years ago, the country was in the middle of a global pandemic and about to go into the first COVID lockdown. Today, while life has returned to normal for many, there are still those living with the devastating consequences of the virus. Latest figures estimate that one in 143 people in England were infected with COVID-19 on the 6th of March this year. Those infected between November and February face a 1 in 224 chance of being hospitalised, although that risk varied with age. It's more difficult to know how many people are infected with long COVID as the last official statistics were published a year ago. At that time, an estimated 1.9 million people in the UK were experiencing symptoms more than four weeks after infection. Our health correspondent, Jamie Coulson, has been to meet two patients whose lives have been changed by long-lasting symptoms of COVID. Long COVID, I think, is an invisible illness. If I wasn't wearing the sunglasses because of the light intolerance and I wasn't wearing the mask, I'd look pretty normal. But I'm just so, so far from what my normal used to be. Mike first caught COVID in October 2020 and then again in September 2022. Both infections caused catastrophic long-lasting symptoms that include extreme fatigue, brain fog, breathlessness, pain and hearing loss. There are times when the once active 61-year-old can be bed-bound for up to 20 hours a day. My world has shrunk. Um, so I used to travel a lot with work, I used to travel a lot with fun. Um, I would dance 12, 15 hours a week, did a lot of hill walking and fell walking. I loved, loved, loved being in the hills. And my world has shrunk literally from the world to this house. It's difficult to know exactly how many people are living with long COVID as the Office for National Statistics stopped publishing data a year ago. However, NHS statistics show there were more than 1,500 new referrals to long COVID clinics in England in January alone. Everybody's Professor right, Stephen Griffin like is a virologist at the University of Leeds. You can develop long COVID after any sort of severity of, of COVID infection. So we are still pretty much at the same level of risk um, as we were in terms of the number of cases that we're seeing. Our individual chance of developing long COVID has reduced because of vaccination, but the sheer scale of SARS-CoV-2 infections in the country still means that we're seeing, we estimate, somewhere around one or two million people suffering from this condition even now. I thought we were going to die. They had to like resuscitate me twice. And then you see people dying around you, wondering if you're going to wake up the next day. Kelly Day spent 31 days in hospital with COVID, 11 of which were in intensive care. More than three years later, she still struggles with a range of debilitating symptoms, but feels there isn't much understanding. People say, oh, you know, you look well, but they don't know what's going on in the inside and mentally as well. It's just been forgotten about, you know what I mean? And they just think, oh, I've got long COVID, it's just an excuse. Do you know what I mean? But there's a lot of people suffering. Both Kelly and Mike have received support from long COVID clinics, but the direction of their lives has been completely changed. Jamie Coulson, BBC Look North. 
Well, earlier I spoke to Dr John Wright, who is the director of the Bradford Institute of Health Research, which has looked at some of the wider impacts of the pandemic on society. I began by asking him about the impact of long COVID. Well, you can listen to Mike and Kelly's stories. I mean, that's very typical for severe long COVID patients. They say how it just turns their lives upside down. They become shadows of what they were. And you've been looking at the wider impact on society in your research. What have been your most worrying findings? Yeah, thanks to the thousands of families in our Born in Bradford study, we've been really at the forefront of researching COVID and you know, understanding its impact, understanding the risk factors for long COVID. And our attention really is turning to the children and young people now. And what we're finding is if you're born during the pandemic, for example, children are slow in meeting their developmental speech um, milestones. They're getting more anxious as toddlers. Uh, they're not you know, struggling to interact with other children. And the teenagers are having this epidemic of uh, anxiety and depression and, and sadly loneliness. And what lessons have been learned? So we've got a big national COVID inquiry going on at the moment. Many lessons will be learned. But I think the key one is how unequal our country has become. We, we live in one of the most unequal countries in the world. And I think, you know, it's the poorest who have really suffered, who've had the most infection, the most deaths, the highest risk of long COVID and the most financial impacts following the pandemic. As we can see, it's still affecting people's lives, but there are many people out there who say the pandemic is behind us. What's your view on that? Well, you know, it feels like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? It feels like a different world. But the consequences, you know, we're going to get the shock waves for many years to come. You know, in the NHS, we've got waiting lists up to 8 million. Um, and when we see, you know, when we work with the schools, we realise how that educational loss during the pandemic is really playing out into long term effects on the children. And of course, you were there on those COVID wards in the height of the pandemic. What are your abiding memories? Well, you know, this time four years ago it was why the hell is the government not having lockdown earlier? But um, and then we had all the sort of chaos of PPE and things like that. I, th I think my abiding memory is our resilience, um, both in the NHS, you know, how we pulled together, how innovative and creative we were. And I think we across society, actually. Yeah, we've learned a lot, Dr. John Wright. Thank you for your time this evening. Pleasure. Well, it wasn't just people who were affected by the COVID pandemic. Many businesses were also severely impacted, including some of our best known tourist attractions. In Pickering, the North Yorkshire Moors Railway has struggled with rising costs and falling visitor numbers in the years following the pandemic. At one stage last year, there were concerns for its long term future. Now, though, as the railway prepares to open for Easter, managers say they've turned a corner. Phil Connell has more. You've missed a bit. I've missed a bit, right. They're preparing to welcome their first visitors of the year. At the North Yorkshire Moors Railway in Pickering, the Easter break activities start this weekend. A time to spruce up the station and fire up the engines. Well, it's a bit like coming out of hibernation, you know, with the, 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 the lighter nights and days now are sort of coming together and we're, we're all getting ready for the start of the season. And it actually has been a long winter of maintenance for us guys. And the clock's ticking. It's literally, you know, we're waiting for the gong and then we go. We start running again. And as the doors open here on Saturday, bosses will be hoping for an extra busy season. <laughs> As with many attractions, the impact of the COVID pandemic is still being felt here. At one stage, ticket sales fell by 50% and coupled with a big rise in operating costs at one stage last year, concerns were expressed about the railway's long-term future. But managers say they've turned a difficult corner and this year it's full steam ahead. It's just been a bit tighter than it, we might have liked it to have been. But now I think we're through that and we're certainly in a lot stronger position than we have feared we might be. Um, we're definitely here to stay. We're not going anywhere. But with rising costs and, of course, a cost of living crisis, how do attractions like yours survive? With difficulty, to be honest, it, it's tough. Yeah, unfortunately, we push our prices up a bit as much as people feel they can afford attract more people to the railway as best we can. From a commercial point of view, it's a very important start. And it actually sort of dictates normally how the rest of the year is going to go. If you have a good spring and plenty of people come out and, and it starts well, then we tend to find the rest of the year follows that trend. So, yeah, we're hoping for a good start. 
and the railway's increasing role as a film location it's hoped will attract a new generation of steam enthusiasts. This famous Yorkshire attraction steering a steady course through what have been difficult times. Phil Connell, BBC Look North, Pickering. Oh, fabulous, isn't it? And we wish them a longer future ahead. Now you're watching Friday's Look North, still to come on tonight's programme. We'll be in Sheffield to meet two rising stars who have just scooped a major film award. But first, West Yorkshire Police have launched an investigation into alleged racist comments made by a leading Conservative Party donor. Lee's businessman Frank Hester reportedly said MP Diane Abbott made him want to hate all black women. He's apologised for making what he called rude comments about her. Corinne Wheatley reports. Well, these comments were allegedly made by Frank Hester during a meeting here in Leeds in 2019. The comments were reported in The Guardian earlier this month. In reference to Diane Abbott, Frank Hester is alleged to have said, you just want to hate all black women because she's there, and I don't hate all black women at all, but I think she should be shot. Now, he's apologised for making what he called rude remarks about her, but he said uh, they had nothing to do with her gender or the colour of her skin. Diane Abbott described the comments as frightening and reported them to police. Now, what we found out today is that West Yorkshire Police have said the investigation has been passed on to them because the meeting had taken place here in Horsforth. This is the headquarters for TPP. That's the health tech firm that was founded by Frank Hester, who's also a prominent donor to the Conservative Party. Uh, we have tried to speak to Frank Hester again today. Unfortunately, we haven't been successful. West Yorkshire Police say they're now working to establish the facts and ultimately ascertain if a crime has been committed. The force also says it recognises there's been a strong reaction to these allegations and they're asking anybody to get in touch if they can directly assist with the investigation. Corin Wheatley with that report. Next tonight, for the second year in a row, Leeds Bradford Airport has exceeded the number of flights it's allowed to fly at night time, but they won't be facing prosecution. In 2022, the airport flew 747 extra flights at night time and promised it wouldn't happen again, but it has done. Last year, the airport flew an additional 577 night flights. Spencer Stokes has the latest. It's the second year in a row that Leeds Bradford Airport has broken through the cap on the number of permitted night flights. When it first happened, the airport's chief executive told Look North it was a one-off. We absolutely take responsibility for the fact that we have flown more flights than we were permitted to fly. We apologise to our neighbours for any impact that that may have caused on them. And we've put in place all of the controls and the reports necessary to make sure that these errors will never happen again. It has happened again. The legal limit has been exceeded once more. The rules permit LBA to fly 2,920 night flights. In 2022, they flew an additional 747. Last year, the figure was 577 additional flights. Still a substantial breach. Leeds City Council warned LBA last year that a repeat could lead to a prosecution but they haven't followed through on that threat. The council say the decision was not taken lightly, but they don't think it's in the public interest to bring a prosecution. And the cost of that prosecution would far outweigh the maximum permitted fine against the airport, which is £2,500. We know the, the airport broke the rules in 2022. We know they broke them in 2023 it's almost certain they're going to break them in 2024. So how long is this going to go on until some action is taken? These rules were agreed by the airport, they must stick to them. But effectively, the council has given the airport a green light to continue to flout the nighttime rules, and that's going to have a direct impact on the health of the people of this city. Today, the airport said, we are disappointed with the decision on the breach of night movements. We remain confident in our interpretation of the planning conditions. The interpretation of the rules is subject to ongoing discussions between Leeds City Council and Leeds Bradford Airport. But the council has ruled that private jets do count towards night flights. A further decision will be made by the council before October on whether the airport has broken the cap for the last decade. 
The airport maintains it has no desire to operate an unlimited number of flights. The question remains, will it exceed the night flight limit this summer? Spencer Stokes, BBC Lot North, Leeds. Now I'll take a look at this fantastic photograph of togetherness because when sporting communities come together, powerful things can happen. And today, football fans from across West Yorkshire took part in a charity walk in aid of the Derby Rimmer MND Foundation. It's been organised in honour of Bradford City legend Stephen Derby and former Huddersfield town forward Marcus Stewart. Both of them live with motor neurone disease. The challenge began at Valley Parade this morning and called in at Elland Road and the John Smith Stadium. Our sports reporter Sally Hurst has been following the walkers. Let's go team. 8am <laughs> and Bantams fans are gathering at Valley Parade to show their support for an important cause. I lost my dad this year at MND, so it's personal quite personal for me. It, it is a cruel disease, so anything anybody can do to raise a little bit of money, a bit of research into it, it's beneficial, yeah. The walk covers 170 miles over three days and is dedicated to city legend Stephen Darby and former Huddersfield town forward Marcus Stewart, both living with motor neurone disease. Now, you know, there's a few people with a higher profile that, you know, are, are starting to get MND in, in the spotlight and trying to um, trying to find a cure for it, whereas 20 years ago there was, there was no chance. So I think, yeah, I think it's going to be it's going to be a tough few days for these guys, but ultimately we're all here for the same reason. Awareness about MND has increased with the involvement of high-profile players from across sport, including Rob Burrow, here today with wife Lindsay. They're taking part in the first leg of the walk such a special day I think again just to kind of you know keep banging that drum keep raising that awareness and just so show support and um, you know we're, we're all one team and uh, you know want to continue to keep banging that drum and you're actually going to do part of the walk how challenging is that going to be for you and Rob um well I'm no Kevin Sinfield so we, we, uh, we, we we'll be, yeah nice steady walk I think just to be here and be part of you know of this group and uh, really looking forward to it today the first section of the challenge goes from Bradford to Leeds via Thornbury, Pudsey and Farnley and for once, the sun is actually shining. Well, the walkers are around 10 miles into their challenge and just arriving here at Elland Road. Here, walkers were greeted by other members of the MND community, including campaigner Ian Flatt. Sometimes, even when you're surrounded by people that you know, you can feel quite lonely in this disease. And you come to events like this and it really lifts you and you realise you're not alone, actually. And um, there's such a, a supportive community uh, and it's really, yeah, it's uplifting. Well done, guys. From Elland Road, a hilly section of the A62 leads to the John Smith Stadium in Huddersfield. Not too bad, a few blister patches, but we're all right, yeah, we're good. It was horrendous, talk to them. <laughs> Why was it horrendous? <laughs> there was hills, hills that we didn't expect and there was no pubs. <laughs> The walkers now have around 23 miles in the bag, only another 152 to go. Next up is the other side of the Pennines at Oldham Athletic, with the finish line in Anfield on Sunday afternoon. Sally Hurst, BBC Look North, Huddersfield. An incredible effort despite those flipping hills. Now we're staying with sport and all eyes will be on Sheffield on Saturday as two of Yorkshire's rising boxing stars take to the ring for their title fights. Terry Harper from Doncaster is hoping to become a three-weight world champion as she takes on Sandy Ryan. And Dalton Smith will be entering the ring in his home city as he takes on Jose Zepeda for the WBC Silver Super Lightweight title. This is my chance to become a three-weight world champion, so uh, I am moving back down away from the division above. This, this new weight, 147, is a lot more natural to me and um, I feel a lot more comfortable this way. So I'm excited to get in the ring and, and put on a good performance. The more we win, the more you know, pressures get put on us. But you know, that's what brings the best out in us and you know, Saturday night, that's what I'll be doing. Next tonight, a story of bravery, mystery and friendship. And that's just on screen. Two young women from South Yorkshire have won a major film award for people with learning disabilities or autism. Today, Kirsty and Jenny were back in Sheffield for a bit of a do. Tom Ingle has been to meet them. 
Really good job. And these are for you as well. For Kirsty and Jenny, a well-deserved salute from their friends and fellow artists. Their short film, A Tale of Swords and Smoke, sees them take on the role of warriors, who end up befriending a dragon. It's earned them an Oscar Bright Award. That's a film festival dedicated to celebrating work produced by people with learning disabilities or autism. You're the winner. What, how, you're both winners. How does yeah, that feel? Winners. I feel amazing. I feel proud. I like acting. I like filming. I like the best part. The dragon, I think. Dragon. The fearsome dragon itself, who ends up sharing jam sandwiches with our heroes, was built by other members of the Artworks Collective in Sheffield. The joy here is infectious, as creativity is unleashed in any possible way you can imagine. We support adults with learning disabilities and our autism to facilitate their art practice. The filming that we do is becoming obviously really recognised um, and it's heavily led by the artists that we support. It came about though, didn't it, because we said, what is your dream? What would yeah. you like to do? And the answer we got back was, I'd like to be a princess. Yeah. So um, based around that, we were like, OK, leave it with us. Let's go in, have a think. Um, and that's how the film was born. The master of cardboard. Oh, who could this be? Andrew! <laughs> with so many of the artworks artists involved, it was only right and proper to hold a mini Oscars to celebrate their Oscar. Like all good stories, it's a happy ending all round. Awards success, the promise of future films to come, and most importantly, two young friends, doubtless on their way to greater things. Tom Ingle, BBC Look North, Sheffield. Fantastic, richly deserved. Now, dare I say it, spring is officially here, which should mean our gardens are bursting into bloom. These beautiful flowers are, of course, called camellias, and from growing wild in China, they became prized showpieces for the 18th century aristocracy. Living at Wentworth Woodhouse since 1738, the building which houses them was in a state of decay. But as Phil Bodmer reports, the camellias now have a spruced up home, which everyone can enjoy over a choice of tea from around the world. These beautiful blooms belong to one of the most important camellia collections in the world. For more than 200 years, they've survived and thrived right here in South Yorkshire. Three, two, Dating from 1738, this elegant orangery served as a tea house for the Marchioness of Rockingham. Now, thanks to a £5 million restoration, everyone can enjoy what was once the preserve of the aristocracy. Along with uh, the building requirements, we made sure the plants had what they needed. So we have a rainwater harvesting tank, which is about 40,000 litres, so they'll always be watered with nice, soft Yorkshire rainwater. We've got vents and we've got blinds, so they are quite pampered in their new rarefied atmosphere. And for a lot of years, because there was no roof, they lived, like say, a feral lifestyle. Now everything they need is down to myself and the garden team. Balancing conservation while combining contemporary purpose has not been without challenge. The particular challenge with this building is the fact that over the time it has moved considerably, partly because of the mining that's happened around here. But as you can see and feel, the building itself is leaning quite considerably out. And in this instance, we've added blinds to increase the protection for the camellias. So we're putting the windows back in on the wall, leaning wall, but we're adding new blinds, which themselves are hanging quite straight, which shows you exactly how much the walls themselves are leaning. The fact that it was Lady Rockingham's tea room in its past life, and, and of course that we found out the, the real significance of the camellias. So they have been, throughout this project, the most important thing, both in terms of looking after them whilst we've been doing it and, and going forward. There is no doubt the camellia house is a jewel in the Wentworth Woodhouse crown. By preserving its past, its hope will guarantee its future. Phil Bottomer, BBC Look North, Rotherham. Oh, aren't 
they? Absolutely beautiful. Keely, how's your garden looking at this time of the year? Dreadful. <laughs> I didn't put <laughs> any bulbs in and now I'm really regretting it. It looks absolutely sorry for itself. Well, we've got a new patio, so I'm very excited. Oh, very I'm going to be out doing some potting in the next few weeks. Well, now Phil's weeks. picked up a few tips. He can come absolutely. and help you, can't he? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what, the time will fly by talking gardening. Talking of gardens. And weather. <laughs> yes. Look at this lovely picture here. Uh, the garden's looking lovely um, just in front of uh, Nairsborough Castle. And uh, I suspect lots of the gardens will look nicer today because it has been a lovely bright day uh, with some sunshine at last uh, but it's also been quite a blustery day I thought this picture summed up today really well these daffodils being blown sideways uh, in the breeze with some nice blue skies uh, overhead you can keep your weather pictures uh, coming into the weather watchers uh, page or you can contact us on social media as well keely.donovan on instagram on x keely donovan so things are turning cooler. We're already in the cool air, but it really will feel cool, uh, I think, tomorrow because of the strength of the breeze. Temperatures are about average, but the strength of the breeze will knock a few degrees off those temperatures. It'll also blow in a few showers as well, which could be a little bit uh, wintry uh, overnight tonight and first thing. You can see the air coming down uh, from uh, the north. The breeze eases down on Sunday, some sunshine on Sunday, but then the Atlantic takes over again as we head through next week. It does look unsettled uh, with low pressure dominating showers or longer spells of rain. We're in the cooler air because uh, this strip of cloud was a cold front. That was the rain we got last night. So now we're on the cooler side of that. It is going to be cooler uh, over the next few days. And we're just starting to see a few showers pushing down from the north. Those will continue through this evening and overnight, perhaps a little bit wintry uh, over the tops. And across the tops, uh, we may well have some icy stretches into tomorrow morning because we are looking at a touch of frost away from the hills. Temperatures dropping back to around 2 or three degrees and it will remain breezy throughout. Let's have a quick look at those high water times then at 3.36 in Filey and at 3.19 in Scarborough. So a chilly start to the day tomorrow. Watch out for some icy stretches. There'll be more cloud around tomorrow compared with today and there will be showers on and off being blown in on that brisk northwesterly breeze. Um, and that breeze really will take the edge off the temperatures. Temperatures are not too far away from the seasonal norm. We should be at around 9 or 10 degrees. But factor in the breeze, I think it'll feel more like 5 or 6 degrees. Another cool start to the day on Sunday. Uh, and there could be the odd shower for the coast where, where it will remain breezy. Uh, otherwise, that breeze will ease down. and It looks like there'll be some decent spells of sunshine on Sunday. And you see temperatures that little bit higher. But next week, low pressure dominates our weather uh, with showers or longer spells of rain temperatures about average amanda oh dear that lovely sunshine was nice while it lasted mm -hmm. thank you very much keely that's it from us phil will be here with your late news if he can tear himself away from those camellias good night <laughs>